The firing of Don Cherry has certainly made for some interesting conversations over the last while. We live in a society that's very easily offended and often demands the firing of those deemed to have said something offensive. Now, the term cancel culture has arisen out of this sort of thing, and joining us to talk about it is Anthony Fury. He's a national columnist for the Sun Newspapers chain. You can read some of his articles online at fury.ca. Uh, good to have you with us, Anthony. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, you write in one of your recent articles, The Lost Art of Disagreement. Love the title. Uh, but how, when you were in university, I mean, you went to hear some controversial speakers. That happens at universities, at least it used to. And the response from students and faculty was uh, different than it is today. Do you want to explain uh, some of those differences? Yeah, I remember going to a whole variety of public events, and I don't just mean my classes, but speakers come in from out of town, from other universities. Uh, sometimes they're official events, other times some group is renting the space, and you're on campus, you go, oh, what am I going to do this weekend? Oh, there's this thing happening, that thing happening, okay, let's check it out. And sometimes, you know, oh, this is right right up my alley, I, I want this, I, you know, I agree with this. Other times you go, oh man, this is going to be interesting, this is going to be trouble, and you go check it out. I will admit sometimes as a student you just go because you think there's going to be free food there, but still, you go for a whole variety of reasons and then sometimes you hear someone say something you go oh man well that's kind of incendiary and then you chuckle about it and maybe someone raises their hand at question period and yells back at the guy and then they yell back and forth and then everybody goes home no one pulls the fire alarm nobody says we have to shut down the university there's not this post-mortem where there's a, a you know a, a group hug afterwards and they have to bring in uh you know all these different emotional support animals and so forth this stuff that we hear this day and age and, and that was not that long ago i'm 35 years old i mean it, it was not too many years ago and yet now you just can't have any speaker out there that's really challenging the orthodoxy, which is really supposed to be the point, I believe, of higher education. Yeah, exactly. Hey, let's challenge the status quo. Let's talk this through and hear controversial opinions. It's part of university, right? Um, we want to grow some minds, teach people how to think. So we have this thing that happens far too often, cancel culture, right? If you have a message that's politically uh, incorrect, that politically correct mob, they don't like you, they'll, they'll try to shut you down. I mean, literally with violent rallies uh, calling for people's jobs, right? Yeah, it's really alarming because look, I'm a happy warrior. I have very strong opinions and I have no problem going on radio shows and television programs and arguing it out and so forth. And then afterwards, if, if the person beside me says, hey, well, you know, want to go to the bar, want to grab a coffee? Hey, as long as they're buying, I'm game for it kind of thing. I mean, it's not like someone disagrees with you and I'm indignant to learn that not every human being is like me. That's just life. That's adult life. And, and, and you get on with things. And I find more and more now just disagreement is being characterized Characterized as things, speech that can expose people to harm, and all of these kind of labyrinthine arguments they come up with that are basically cheap excuses to shut down differing opinions. Well, I really appreciate actually Ellen DeGeneres uh, recently again. She she got in hot water for uh, you know <laughs> you know saying that she she was sitting in the same booth right watching a football game with uh, former President George Bush. Very different political opinions, obviously, and yet she's saying you know what we can still be friends, and you know shouldn't we all have an attitude like that? And and I think she's bang on, but she took a lot of heat for it. Now, Don Cherry, let's, let's talk about Don a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, did he get a fair shake? I mean, yeah, he certainly didn't maybe choose the best wording, uh, but, you know, was what he actually said racist? Was it hateful? Was it something he should get fired for? Uh, was it as bad as, you know, I don't know, let's say wearing blackface? Not that anybody's done that recently. Any thoughts? Well, well, what I will say is I received feedback from, from readers all across the country, and people have very strong views, and they didn't necessarily follow uh, stereotypes. For instance, there would be sort of the middle-aged, rugged hockey dad who said, good riddance to Don Cherry, I want him out of here, you know, I want to s never see the guy again. And then we had new immigrants, new to Canada, who said, two thumbs up, we support everything Don Cherry said, and everything in between and so forth. So there was a wide variety of opinion. Okay, great, that's Canada, that's free speech. That's how these things work. I think the part about him not getting a fair shake is the disproportionality of the whole thing. We have a guy who says a whole lot of things, does a lot of things, does a lot of great things for charity. I mean, the stories I told about this guy uh, with, with no gain for him, not charging anyone or anything, going out of his way to help people who were in the hospital with cancer, all these stories. I mean, it, it was really remarkable stuff to hear. And then we've got this one sentence where you say, okay, well, what does this word mean and that word mean if we rearrange this? 
this, that, and the other? Should he have said the thing? Maybe not. Was it this, that, or the other? Maybe it is. But did the guy deserve to become public enemy number one for a full week period, lose his job and so forth? I think it's a bit too much. Yeah, I hear you. You know, I think a lot of us have dads or granddads that are a lot like Don Cherry. You know what? The heart of gold give you the shirt off their back. And sometimes they say, you know, give you a one-off statement. You're like, wow. Boy, you know, maybe reel that one in, right? But you know what? I mean, oh, wow, yeah. Are we gonna, you know, kick granddad out of the family? You know, probably an overreaction. Now, it is interesting to compare uh, Cherry's comments to those of Jess Allen, a panelist on the social TV show. Now, she said she doesn't worship at the altar of hockey and found that in her experience that those who did all tended to be white boys who were, you know, bullies. <laughs> a lot of hockey fans asking, maybe she should have been fired. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, her remarks were definitely much more specific, targeted. She mentioned an identifiable group in her comments. So if you want to sort of compare and contrast with Cherry, she certainly had the greater offense. But I will say, and I remember I posted this to social media, I don't want anyone to get fired for a thing that they're saying when they're supposed to be going on a TV show, talking, voicing their opinion, which is what Don Cherry and Jess Allen were both paid to do. I'd never heard of her before. I don't watch that show ever. So why am I going to say she should be fired from a show I don't watch? If that's what the viewers like, if that's how they roll, I'm mature enough to say, well, the social ain't for me. Click. Done. And that's it. Yeah. Now, I wonder... Uh, on the flip side, if Don Cherry had apologized the next day, you know, a little bit like, you know, um, this gal did, would he still be working for Sportsnet today? Or, or, or was he a target? Well, you know, the way you characterize it, I mean, Don Cherry did sort of walk back what he said, mm -hmm. in part. He acknowledged he should have said things differently. He just didn't want to play the corporate game where I guess they had some canned apology. Jess Allen, she also didn't really apologize either. It was this weird underhanded comment about trying to rationalize what she said. So I think they're both very much in the same boat in both cases. I, I, think, I think it's mostly a double standard. It's more or less the same offense. One got fired, one didn't. I do think if Don Cherry had you know, said the corporate statement that Ron McLean had said, I think he'd probably still be there. Yeah, well, again, maybe it's my conservative bias coming out, but maybe she has the progressive advantage, you know, uh, in the media circles. So uh, now, as you point out, why, why can't we simply disagree and then move on? You know, why do we insist that someone lose their job or hold violent rallies to prevent someone from sharing their personal opinions? I mean, why is that? Well, I, I don't really know. I mean, it's been really disappointing to see this happen. I, I think social media plays a game, 24-hour news cycle. I mean, I know you and me work in that realm, but you get what I'm saying here, that uh, there's this constant need to make something out of everything. There's a constant yeah. need... Uh, to, to go and, and, and say your private thoughts in this sort of public space. And I think we also have a problem not realizing, I mean, I look at Facebook and Twitter and those things as kind of like the online version of hanging out at Timmy's or being at the bar and so forth, where you're allowed to just, you know, do your thing, say your thing. But the problem is it is writ large for the whole public to see. And then people say, all right, let's get that guy. Uh, and then it becomes a feeding system where we're all just supposed to attack each other and, and render each other unemployable. It's, it's a pretty sad state of affairs. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what ails it, but there's something sort of collectively in the water these days that ain't right. Yeah, I, I think it is tied in with social media. I think it's given us a tool that we've learned to use the wrong way. You know, and maybe it's just me, but it seems so ironic to me that the same people who call anyone who disagrees with them hateful seem to be the same people who show up at, you know, these crazy rallies where crowds shout hateful name-calling insults at those who hold a different viewpoint. <laughs> You're hateful. <laughs> so we'll shout some more hate yeah, well, at you, and this is going to make things better. What's hate speech? They say, what's hate speech? It's speech I hate. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. and so we say hateful things in response. It's just a, it's a vicious circle. Uh, you know, and I wonder, is it just a minority of people who behave this way and simply get a lot of media attention? Is it the media hyping this up? Or has this somehow now permeated our culture to the point that everyday people, regular people, think this is the right way to respond to those things, to those who see things you know, differently than we do? I mean, that just, yeah, I kind of go tilt. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, I get really frustrated when I see these news headlines and stories saying, oh, there's so much hate out there and so much anger and people are so divided. But because when I walk around in my community or any great communities in Canada I visit, I just see regular middle class people who are working hard and caring about their families and people of all walks of life are coming together in every city and there's relatively little friction going on. So I think it kind of maligns Canada, whether it's talking about Don Cherry or some of the things Justin Trudeau says about our country kind of upsets me because he talks about how we're all divided. And I go, 
it's just not true. There's some really incendiary knuckleheads online who like to say a bunch of goofy things from all sides of the spectrum, but Canadians are not full of hate. They're not full of anger. We all get along pretty well. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I wonder how much of it is, is hype. And again, social media plays into this as well. I mean, as many people who you know, kind of want their 15 minutes of fame and so, hey, we'll jump on somebody, pile on, uh, you know, to, to, to build ourselves up, right? I don't know, to look important. Well, have you ever, ever thought about, you know, why are political parties, I mean, TV networks, universities, that sort of thing, they're caving to this pressure to fire anyone who says something uh, deemed offensive. Uh, again, it's going to be offensive to some people, not to others. Uh, do you think we're going to see someone take a stand and say, hey, you know, get over it. We're not going to fire someone just because this happened to offend you. Yeah, occasionally we do see some people take stands. I, I know there were calls for the Chick-fil-A outlet that opened in Toronto, just around the corner uh, from my offices at Post Media. Calls for that to, you know, not open, boycott it, be shut down. And people just kind of yawned at all these activists and advocates on the streets saying it needed to be shut down. Now, I guess that had to do with the fact this was solely one corporate entity. There was no university administrator or mayor or what have you to come in and pressure them. So that was nice to see. One thing that was a bit more challenging, in the city of Toronto, we had an incident where a, a radical feminist speaker, Megan Murphy, you're probably familiar with the story, she's been doing a tour of the country speaking about... I guess she's a feminist who doesn't believe that transgender people should should be allowed access to all women's spaces. And the feminist community is kind of dividing that. She's been called a hate monger. She's been vilified. It's really been awful stuff. And Toronto City Council actually encouraged the library to get her booted from here. The mayor, John Tory, was happy to vote against her. And the chief librarian, who doesn't seem to be someone of any partisan stripe, said, no, we're putting our foot down. We're not doing this. This is a space for all ideas. Libraries don't censor books. They don't censor speech or thought. This event, it followed our booking protocols. It stands. And a lot of people have been heralding that woman. Her name's Vickery Bowles. She's the chief librarian for her bravery there and just free speech principles. I loved hearing those kinds of stories. And, you know, I think that as, as the public, you know, we need to, you know, encourage that as well. Write her a letter. You know, I don't know. Hey, Send her an email saying, we really appreciate you taking a stand. We need to encourage That's that a great sort point. of thing. Oh, you bet. We need to hear that. You know what? The majority of Canadians, I think, are for this. Now, uh, <laughs> there's so many angles we could talk about today. We could talk about climate change, right? There's, again, another controversial thing, right? We all have to think the same way or else, you know, we're going to target right. you personally. We're going to take, you know, we're not going to debate the pros or cons of your argument, the science behind it. We're just going to call you a you know, climate right. change denier, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. The rest will take care of itself. We'll just uh, crush you with uh, you know, verbal abuse. I mean, we still hear, hear, hear cultural voices crying out for this diversity and tolerance, but if someone dares to voice a diverse opinion, why does tolerance always seem to get flushed down the toilet? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of influencers out there and sort of the tastemakers and gatekeepers who they have their agenda set and they have the narratives that they want to stick with. And then they come up with these sort of word games to block you out. I think the climate change example is a perfect one. Just recently, we've seen a lot of actual climate scientists and people associated with that UN intergovernmental panel on climate change come forward and say, we're actually a little uncomfortable with what a lot of the activists are saying and what young Greta Thunberg is saying, because we never said that the world's going to end in 12 years. We never said it's going to cause math, mass deaths. We never said it's going to cause uh, crazy migration patterns. You guys are taking this way out of hand and you poisoned the well and we're having problems getting action on this. I, I myself, I think that this needs to be a private sector, free market thing. I think if anything heralds the green revolution, it's going to be uh, people deciding to buy the electric vehicles and so forth because the price point is there. I don't want a carbon tax at all. And quite frankly, I think Canada should withdraw uh, from the UN Paris Climate Accord deal. And, and that is just considered, you know, that's total it. You're off the program. Sorry, I have to, to cancel yeah. you. Sorry, Anthony, <laughs> I'm going to have to cancel you. This this won't go to air because you, <laughs> you know, you know I, we could do that, right? And people do that. Say, we're never yeah. going to have Anthony Fury on again because he said that. I mean, yeah. good for you for, for speaking up. You know what? Whether I agree or not doesn't matter. You should be free to say what you think. You know, I sometimes, sometimes wonder if part of the problem is with our university system itself. Is it possible that they have, for so many years, been teaching our students what to think as opposed to how to think? You know, think it through critically, analyze this from all sides, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you see this in documents, whether it's at university level or even at the elementary school level, that we now have a, a social justice learning system. 
We now have this equity policy for all our classes. And you go, what does all this mean? Well, it's basically buzzwords to mean politicization of different curriculums. And it's it's incredibly alarming to see things head in this direction because it really puts the lid on free inquiry. And I think you get two things happening. You get more and more people kind of brainwashed in it, and you get more and more people rebelling against it and saying, we don't want anything to do with this. And again, it puts us at loggerheads. Education should be a pretty sort of moderate, you know, just the facts, please, ma'am, uh, kind of situation where we all benefit, whatever our our religion or our political views and so forth. It's it's, it's quite sad, actually, all of this stuff. I hear you. We need a little more Columbo in our lives. Just the facts, ma'am. Uh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I'm out of time. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's been a blast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You bet. Anthony Fury, a national columnist for the Sun Newspapers chain. Again, you can read some of his uh, fascinating articles at fury.ca.